Welcome to Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itchon, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. Ro, have you filed to run for governor yet? It seems like everybody else is. Well, you know, I can get 40 people together by this afternoon. If you sign mine, I'll sign yours, Tim. Okay. But then we just have to come up with, I think it's $2,000 or something. So if our listeners would like to send us a buck. Well, maybe, uh, I think my mother would like to see me on the ballot. I I will check with her. (laughs) Bragging (laughs) rights to her friends. Yes. So Tim, the big news here in the Southland in Southern California is the rising COVID cases due to the Delta variant. So in LA County, we've seen about a thousand cases uh, the last three days. And according to the LA Times, that's about a 240% increase from just a couple of weeks ago. So now LA County is is recommending that people wear masks indoors, everyone, uh, including vaccinated people. Uh, And that's, you know, it's just been about three weeks since the supposedly grand reopening. I'm not going to wear a mask indoors, at least not in the office. I hardly run to anyone in the hallway. I think I would wear a mask if I were going to a a crowded grocery store. And only because I would want to keep my mother super safe. She's elderly, and I'd like to visit her on weekends. And I don't want to be, you know, asymptomatic and then give it to her. And as we all know, the vaccine is just a little less effective for seniors. What's going on in in Sacramento, Tim? Well, lots of things going on. Lots of things are going on. I mean, I think it's interesting that we had, um, you know, on the issue of mass, you had the CDC on Friday come out and say, that um, students who are vaccinated don't need to wear a mask returning to the classroom in the fall. Yet California announced, even though despite the mantra, listen to the CDC, we're going to require all students to wear masks regardless of their vaccination status. So it, it really, it's that issue that we've talked about throughout this reopening is the messaging. You know, if the vaccines are effective, which they are, well, then we need to be clear messaging wise that You don't need to wear a mask if you are vaccinated. Only the unvaccinated need to wear a mask. And all these cases that we're seeing, a huge percentage, it's the unvaccinated who are getting it. Oh, yeah. I think it's about 99% here in in L.A. County. So it's it's sad. It could be prevented. You know, there are, I think the term is vaccine busters, people who have the vaccine. There's a chance some of them will get COVID, but it's a very, very small number. Again, you're not going to die and you're not going to have to go to the hospital. So around here, it seems pretty back to normal. I'd say it's about 50-50, maybe a little less people wearing masks versus not wearing masks. Um, At the store this weekend, I didn't wear a mask. um, And I noticed probably 50-50 people who did versus didn't. So I think people are trying, you know, to return to... uh, to normal life. And and these conflicting messages that you're getting, the CDC versus what California officials are requiring, um, it's certainly interesting. When you also had at the state capitol, there's been a COVID outbreak. Nine people have acquired COVID at the capitol in recent days, and they just announced all members and staff, regardless of your vaccination status, have to wear masks. So again, it's another confidence issue. The scientists are telling you one thing, but government is doing another. Uh, it makes people wonder, who do you trust? And has everyone really been making more political statements than scientific-based decisions all along? Right. And if I have to wear a mask anyway, why get the vaccine? That's right. So the recall effort is underway. Lots of people are throwing their hat in the ring. What are you hearing? Well, this is the key week. I believe it's Friday is the deadline to file for governor as of this past Friday over a hundred people had either filed or had pulled papers to run for governor. I mean, it's, um, you know, when we had the recall in 2003, right, you had Arnold and then you had all these other people. Well, this election is just all these other people. So it's going to be interesting to see, can any of these people break out of the pack or is the leading candidate going to have like 8% of the vote? Well, you know, Tim, maybe you ought to tell our listeners just how easy it is to get your name on the ballot. All you need is 40 signatures and uh, I think it's $2,000, something around there to file. So it's not like it's this huge, you know, Herculean effort where you have to get thousands of signatures and, and, and jump through all these other hoops. That's all you take. Well, everybody 
knows 40 people or, you know, could get 40 people to sign a petition, uh, maybe we should change that to make it a little harder. So, you know, it's encouraging only serious candidates rather than the kind of gadfly candidates you get when you have such simple requirements to get on the ballot. Are there any notable challengers, Republican and or Democrat? Well, no Democrats have emerged yet. And you're, I think all the, the eyes are on what is former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa going to do? Is he going to enter at the last minute or uh, is he going to keep out? You know, we'll see. Um, you're also seeing every Republican in California seems to be running. Uh, you have just this past week, um, Assemblyman Kevin Kiley announced his candidacy and he had a rally at the state capitol uh, to kick off his campaign. Um, you have former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner has been out there running. Um, you have uh, businessman John Cox of the Beast fame is out there running. You have former Sacramento Congressman Doug Osi, who's been running. Um, it's a lot of Republicans from Sacramento running. And then you have uh, just on Friday, um, State Board of Equalization member Ted Gaines filed. Uh, and then you also, um, there are rumors we could see this week, um, talk show host Larry Elders rumored he might be running. Uh, and who knows, there's a lot of time between now and and, and Friday, the filing deadline. So it's going to be a, a wild one. And, and the key question, you know, will any of these people break out of the pack? Should you have Gavin Newsom lightning strike and Gavin Newsom is recalled? You know, what would that say if the winning replacement candidate might not get more than 20% of the vote. Lots of intrigue, political intrigue uh, over the next week. And certainly it, it, it sets up for uh, an interesting campaign. And, and I don't know how voters sort through all of these dozens and dozens of candidates. What do you think is driving uh, some of these Republican candidates to uh, throw their, their hat in the ring when we all know it's, it's a real long shot, especially when there are so many Republicans, it's going to fracture the vote. I mean, it was one thing with Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was able to uh, unite the Republican Party. He had huge name recognition. He's probably the most recognized actor in the world. So why do you think this is the case? It's an off election, right? You don't have to give up a seat to run. And that's usually if you're a politician wanting to move up the ladder. You know, if you have to give up your office to, you know, take a gamble to run, well, it makes you think twice. Well, this time the election's in 2021. So no one has to give up any seat. So I think that's part of it. I think some of it too is kind of a the more the merrier um, thinking. You know, if that guy can run, well, surely I can run. So that's why I say you might see some other legislators randomly decide to run because if everyone's going to get two or three percent, well, maybe I could get four. Right. And I guess it's a light on your resume. Ran for governor in 2021. <laughs> in your obituary, you'll you'll always be former gubernatorial candidate. <laughs> That's right. Well, anyway, we've got a special treat for uh, our listeners for this podcast. Our guest is Carol Roth, a New York Times bestselling author. And she's going to be chatting with PRI's own Wayne Weingarten, who is our PRI senior fellow in business and economics. And they're going to be talking about her new book, The War on Small Business, how the government used the pandemic to crush the backbone of America. So Carol and Wayne chat about the state of our economy, uh, all the money the Fed is printing these days, and, and what's next for America's small business. And this interview was so good, Tim, that C-SPAN asked our permission to, uh, to air it, but our listeners get to hear it now. So it's really a terrific interview. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we know you'll enjoy the interview. I'm so pleased that today we have a New York Times best-selling author, uh, Carol Roth. She comes. She has just uh, produced a new book. It's called "The uh, War on Small Business." It's available today online at your favorite bookseller. And ha having read it, I cannot praise it enough. It raises so many important issues uh, and why small businesses are are so important, and that the regulatory assault that is is being waged before the pandemic and during the pandemic, it's, it's harming small business, which is going to kind of lead to a less prosperous future. And, and I guess with that, I would love to kind of just to dive in and start discussing what, what's wrong. Why are we harming what is really the heart of our economy? And so I guess, Carol, I'd like to start talking about, you know, why is this, in, in your opinion, why was this such an important topic for us to, uh, to get into? 
You know, it's interesting when I talk to people about how many big businesses versus small businesses there are in this country, most people don't have a really good sense of the scope. They think there are millions of big businesses and the sort of like niche of small business, but it's actually the reverse. We have somewhere between 10 and 15,000 large businesses in this country. And before COVID, we had 30.2 million small businesses, 6 million of which had employees, and it accounted for about half the GDP and about half the employment of this country. Uh, so it really is a very significant part of the economy overall. And it's also just an important path uh, for economic freedom. If you think about the path for wealth creation, wealth creation, comes with ownership. And so small business enables anybody and we have people from all over the globe who like to come here to try to pursue that economic freedom, pursue that wealth creation, or in some cases, just other kinds of freedom, uh, flexibility to do what they want, serve to pursue a passion or whatnot. And so preserving that opportunity um, and then the decentralization that comes along with small business and, and you know, really looks a lot more like free market capitalism than a lot of the big businesses do make it so critically important. But man, Wayne, I tell you, everyone says how important small business is. And we certainly hear it from politicians and we do not have enough people walking the talk. So I'm, I'm thrilled um, that you're giving this important discussion a, a platform. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you, when you were just talking, and small businesses, at least my view, is even more important because not only are they 50% of the economy, but they're the 50% that's innovative, right? <laughs> that tomorrow's large businesses are going to come from somebody's garage today. Uh, and so we're stopping that entrepreneurial path to, you know, to come up with new ideas because large businesses, they're all about bureaucracy and cronyism and all these other problems that, you, you know, the, the true free market is in the small business. Yeah, I mean, you do, you do forget that, that every big business that exists today, with the exception of maybe something that was spun off of a bigger entity, started as that small business. It is the stepping stone to big business. Um, but unfortunately, when you disrupt that, whether it's disrupting capital allocation or risk taking or just wholesale shutting them down, it uh, makes it much diff more difficult to get the incentives to have those businesses continue to innovate. You know, I wrote a book 10 years ago about all the risks to small business and, and how hard it is to run a small business. And it's really not for the faint of heart. And a lot of them fail to succeed. But never did I think that the government was going to be the number one risk to small business and we'd be in a situation where they were just going to wholesale shut them down. Yet 15 months later, here we are. That's right. Well, and I'd love to kind of just dive into that, because to me, one of the important contributions of your book is one, there's been a regulatory result. And I would love to, to talk about that as well. But the pandemic, it you know, people talk about how we needed to support small businesses and we spent money on the idea that we needed to support small businesses, yet the, all of the policies were kind of geared towards, you know, in practice, harming small businesses. I guess before we get into that, one of the things you talk about in the book, and to me it was one of the most important parts, is you start with the timeline and you start to say, the pandemic is just as much of a government failure in so many ways as it was kind of, you know, pandemics and kind of all of the, the biology that goes on with that. And I would love to kind of dive into that to start talking about before we actually had a pandemic here, what could the government have done <laughs> to, to, to prevent that or at least lessen the impact? Yeah, this was fascinating to me as I was doing the research for this book. And as I told you offline, the sort of three and a half different books that I wrote during the pandemic that ended up as this book. Um, how many things, even though we lived through it, were misreported or not reported? And in doing the, the research and kind of laying it out, it, it was really such a head scratcher. Um, you know, part of it, you know, right, right up front, which was fascinating to me, is you had this trade deal that was signed with China. Uh, which really, I feel like, put the blinders on any sort of pushback against what we were hearing coming out of China, because it had been going on for years and years, and finally we get a win, signed the middle of January of 2020, 
And the president at the time is going, oh, I'm so excited. Oh, thanks so much for your efforts on, on you know, helping with you know, keep this new virus away. And so there wasn't sort of this, this pushback other than a few people I mentioned, Rick Scott in the book, who, who wrote a letter saying like, what, what's going on here, folks? Like, you know, China's not really great in terms of telling the truth. You had the World Health Organization running cover for them. So we really downplayed it um, in the beginning. And then there were some travel restrictions that were put in place. Of course, those were called racist and horrible and xenophobic. Um, so we didn't really get the full extent of those. But I think the biggest issues came around um, the area of testing and what was done for testing. If you look at places like South Korea, they had been through MERS before, they had seen the failures there from a government standpoint. So right away, they enlisted the private sector. Um, they actually pulled them in some cases from their Lunar New Year <laughs> celebration and said, get here right now, we're gonna need you to, to get on top of this. And so they kind of set up testing uh, with the private sector's help right away. There was a company in Germany, a private company, tiny company, put 1.4 million tests out like in a short period of time. And then we had this government bureaucracy where we had all these labs that wanted to do testing. And because of government bureaucracy and because of these emergency use authorizations, which theoretically are supposed to shorten the process, it created a new path where there was just red tape and red tape and red tape. And so in the beginning, the only uh, entity that had testing that could use it was the CDC. So they had to ration it and they had their rules about who could be tested. And these labs were desperate. They, they wanted to, to jump in and they said like, we know how to do this. And it just took so long that, and you know, we, had, we did see this rationing, which is not something that you typically see um, in the free market. So you had those kinds of failures. And then the other one, which just, again, was a, a huge head scratcher, was around the PPP or the PPE, uh, the personal protective equipment, where you know, we're sending, we, we made this, this huge donation. We, we went around and we got all these companies to, to round up PPE and to send it to China. <laughs> instead of stockpiling it for ourselves, thinking, oh, you know, this isn't going to be a problem. So there were all these kind of things, um, you know, where people were, were starting to take actions, the government pushed back, whether it was labs, whether it was people masking, one of the things people don't remember, they told us not to mask, they told us masking was harmful. Uh, all of these crazy things that the media went into before it, they really decided to take a different set of actions. And, and I think that's because pandemics are with us, right? I mean, we're going to experience, there'll be more pandemics and we need right. to learn the right lessons, not just in terms of, well, how do we respond if it's here, but what can we do to prevent it? And that's what I thought that was so important that there are things we can do that would stop the pandemic or at least lessen it and give us a chance to get ahead of it as opposed to being behind the curve, which is really, and to me, that was one of the lessons and I thought, so important in the book is when we talk about government failures, talk about how do we deal with the pandemic and how do we leverage the private sector to hear that there were so many private labs that could have put tests out there. We could have discovered it and kind of people could have been self-isolated and contained the virus before it spread. Uh, to, to, to hear that we blew that opportunity to yeah. me is both depressing, but an important lesson that we need to, to learn. Well, and, and I'll just add on to that. I mean, one of the things that was also frustrating is it's not like they didn't know about this. They had run a series of exercises the year prior called Crimson Contagion. And it was the federal government with 14, I think, different states. Um, and the scenario that they sort of did this mock trial was almost exactly the scenario that that came out. They said something came from, you know, a lab leak in China. I mean, it was like like almost like a little too prescient. And this is what happened. And they ran these pandemic drills. And so they should have known exactly what it was they needed to do. They should have known exactly where the weaknesses were and the holdup and the bottlenecks in the system. And yet they still bungled it over and over again, 
which, you know, kind of, again, speaks to this Frankenstein monster that we've created in terms of big government and the inability to do anything well, um, let alone the actual things that they should be doing. Well, and, and to some extent, the more things you do, right, outside of your core competency, the less well you'll do right. in your core competency. And that's, to me, one of the important reasons why we need a small government is right. they do important things. And if you want them to do it well, stop doing ancillary. Everything things. else. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, talking about doing things poorly, and this is, I thought, really uh, an important, we talk about the small businesses. And getting those back, the pandemic was the policies discriminated, not intentionally, I don't think, but in practice, discriminated against small businesses. Uh, could you talk to that a little bit? Because I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's up to you what conclusion you want to draw, whether this was intentional or unintentional, but it doesn't matter because the outcome is really the same. And we're in a scenario which is really, if you think about what the United States stands for and the government set up to protect the rights of the individual, the most horrifying thing and possibly the most underreported story of the last 15 months. But the government decided that they were going to give you a label and you were either essential or non-essential based on their list of what was essential or non-essential. And it turns out their list was based on political clout and connections, not really any data and science. And uh, as we talked about in the book, and we've talked about previously, like I could get my dog's nails and hair done at a big box retailer, but I couldn't get my nails and hair done. Uh, weed dispensaries, which had not been legal you know, for more than a couple of years in certain jurisdictions, were now deemed incredibly essential. And then the issue with this, you know, the kind of the, the next level issue with picking the winners and losers is that they were then not appropriately compensated for that. So, you know, under the Constitution, the concept of eminent domain is if the government wants to take or use your property for the quote unquote public good, which is basically what happened here. You know, we need to shut some people down. So it looks like we're doing something or whatever that we owe you just compensation. And that didn't happen. So we weren't all in this together. We didn't have everybody locked down. If we had had everyone locked down, if Amazon had to shut down their warehouses, if the big box grocery stores had to shut down, if God forbid the weed dispensaries had to shut down, you know, we probably would have had two to three weeks before there was a lot of screaming going, you can't do this to us. You can't do this to the economy. But because those big connected folks were allowed to you know, continue to, to um, be essential and some of the you know, handful of big uh, folks like airlines that were actually not directly affected, they didn't shut down the airlines, but they you know, indirectly affected by some of these mandates, they got this you know, in- incredible direct bailout. But what the small businesses got was this ridiculous PPP program, which was a fraction of the overall dollars that were put out and certainly not enough to compensate the taking of the property. So you had this like crazy set of winners and losers. And then what that did was enable this huge wealth transfer because you had the small businesses that were closed, their customers were now patronizing the big companies. So those companies' revenues were growing. At the same time, you had the Federal Reserve intervening at historic levels. I mean, at this point, I think their balance sheet is just a hair shy of $8 trillion. And so not only were the the company's revenues slightly higher, but the overall valuations were increased because of all the money that was flowing into the stock market and the disruption of risk into the market. Um, So you saw last year, $3.4 trillion increase in value in seven tech companies. Seven companies gained $3.4 trillion in value. It was a record year for access to capital, record IPOs, record value raised by special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. At the same time, hundreds of thousands of small businesses had shuttered forever. Millions of more were hanging on by a thread. Savers and retirees were earning zero interest on their savings. People are out of work. And you have sort of these two separate economic outcomes that are 100% by government mandate, 
which is, again, the thinking about that in the context of the USA is just completely mind blowing. You know, I, I, and I think this is really worth emphasizing. Is, you know, there are so many things that we, we can uh, disinfect <laughs> from what you just said, because I mean, what you actually have is the response to the pandemic by the government uh, economically. There was a lot of a lot of things that didn't make sense. And I mean, if, if we start with the idea that, first of all, so much money was spent that didn't actually have anything to do with the cost of the pandemic. Right. Sending out checks because there's a pandemic to people who aren't impacted made no sense. It was a waste of money. Or people who are dead. Right. That's right. They <laughs> could spend it. <laughs> I'm guessing no matter what the Keynesian multiplier is, <laughs> if you're dead, you're not going to spend it. Um, but the PPP program, I think, and, and the book talks about this, and I think it was incredibly important that, and, and, and we need to emphasize this, that the all that spending was justified based on the idea that small businesses were being hurt. Right. So we're going to justify everything because everyone loves small businesses. What the government gave small businesses was a program that was complex. They didn't understand it. And so many small business owners who were you maybe got the first tranche of money, but they kept you know upping it again and again. And they were afraid to get the second or third because it took months to find out if they can get their loans forgiven because it was a government program. So as opposed to just saying, here's money we've Take, we've taken something from you. We've said, you can't run your business. That is a taking. And we've said, instead of we're going to compensate you, which was the right thing to do. If you take somebody's property, you need to compensate them for it. We said, we'll give you a loan. And if you jump through our hoops, we'll make that loan forgivable. And the banks won't understand how to forgive those loans. So we've created this Rube Goldberg of a process. And small businesses didn't want it after a while because they couldn't understand it, let alone, and you talked about this. I'd love to spend a little time on this. So much of the PPP went to big businesses anyway. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing was like just the biggest cluster that you could possibly, like if you were trying to do everything wrong, that's what came out of the CARES Act in general and then the PPP provisions. And you hit the nail on the head. The way that it was structured was so opaque and it's not a bailout. Like this is not too big to fail. Oh, you did these bad things and we need to rescue you. This is eminent domain. This is our mandate. So we're giving you money to compensate. But out of all the money that was given out in the CARES Act to universities who you know have already been paid by students, who by the way, got the money from the government anyway, because we mostly nationalized the student lending business, uh, you know, to the Kennedy Center, which was shut down and had furloughed employees and have all kinds of assets and all of these other organizations that just got money outright for, you know, whatever reason, because they're, they're cronies and they're connected. And then you had these struggling small businesses and you're not sending them direct relief money and you have that information. I mean, you have to, as a business, you have to file payroll reports, you have to file you know, with the IRS. And it's not like they don't have access to that information, but you had to go to a bank, you had to jump through hoops, you had to hope your credit was okay or you were going to get denied. And that first tranche was, you know, crumbs was a fraction of the overall CARES package. And because of the way they structured it, it did go to these big companies. I mean, Kanye West, who was named a billionaire by Forbes last year and unveiled his brand new collaboration with The Gap, his company got a PPP loan. Tom Brady got a PPP loan. Certainly these entities likely had other access to capital. They probably weren't going away because of government mandate. So, you know, that was all exhausted in about 13 to 14 days. And so if you're a, a, a smaller business, you're going, okay, I've been turned down or I don't have the paperwork or I don't trust the government. I heard that a lot. Like, I'm, I'm not sure they're actually going to forgive this. And given the fact there were 35 rule changes be time, between the time that it was originally conceived and I think the you know, first month or two, um, it's it, understandable. Like you're trying to save your business. You don't have time to keep up with 35 <laughs> rule changes to what should be due compensation for shutting down your business. So it's, it's like if you were trying to put 
small businesses out of business in a way that was was only 95% obvious instead of 100% obvious. If you're trying to get more people on the government dole and conditioning them that the government's going to take care of you. Like, I don't know. I mean, Wayne, is there anything you would have done <laughs> any differently to, to try to kill off small businesses? Because it's pretty much if you read everything, it, it looks pretty intentional. I think if you would have mandated that they had to get the loans from large banks as opposed to small banks, that might have been uh, a way you could have made it more difficult. But uh, well, most uh, of the I'll money in the beginning actually did go to the big banks. And that was part <laughs> of the problem is they, they service their big customers first because those are the people they have relationships with. So you can't blame them for the crappy structure of the program. Right. Well, and also, you know, the big companies, if you're a small business trying to survive, you don't have time right, to go through and spend the hours that you needed to spend to get the loan. And, you know, time matters, right? I mean, a small business doesn't have you know, five, six, a year's worth of payroll sitting in the bank. They're getting, you know, they're going month to month or maybe, you know, a couple months at best. But And you probably don't even understand it and it's a headache and you're like, oh, I have this file somewhere and what's happening because you don't have a department, right? <laughs> you don't have the economies of scale, which is why, you are more vulnerable and why shutting you down makes a much bigger difference than it would to a bigger entity. And putting all of this in perspective. So if we know, okay, the, the government came in and they, they, they created a problem for small businesses because they didn't respond in the right way. They mandated shutdowns, people retracted. And you know, logically, like I, I, I was guilty of this. You did a lot more online shopping. And when I go online shopping, I go to Amazon, I go to the, the big retailer. So you're not uh, patronizing the, the small businesses. And so, you know, you, you had that natural evolution. But what I thought is particularly valuable in what you did in the book is you said, OK, the pandemic response was biased against small businesses. And that was a problem. And we still see that impact. We still see the economy is recovering. Right. And we you know, have all these things that are looking good, but you still have small businesses that are suffering. You still have small businesses, particularly restaurants and you know, social venues that aren't really coming back. But you put this in perspective, and I thought this is really, really important, of an ongoing, what you call war on small business. And I, I would love to, maybe we can kind of transfer, you know, start talking about what is this ongoing war against small businesses? Because everybody talks about small business and being a wonderful thing, and yet there's a war against them. Yeah, so it's um, it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, as I said, small businesses are this uh, bastion of free markets and decentralization, and they stand as independent thinkers. And if you're trying to consolidate power, which we've seen, you know, depending on how you want to define it, number of laws, the amount that's spending, the purview, the decisions, the areas that they're involved in, you know, we've seen more of a consolidation of power at all levels of government, but particularly the federal government over time. And so if you're trying to continue to consolidate that power, it's much easier to deal with a handful of big businesses than to try to get the support of all of these independent small businesses who, by the way, just want to be left alone anyway. They don't want to be bothered. They just want to, to run their businesses. Um, so the challenge is, is that you know, this was obviously this, this very brazen situation but you can go you know, back decades and see everything from you know, license requirements to regulatory capture that often is painted as, oh, well, we're trying to help the little guy, which ends up helping the big guy. And the most obvious one that's happened you know, within the last you know, call it 12 to 13 years is what's come out of the Great Recession financial crisis. The Dodd-Frank regulation that was supposed to say, you know, bad banks, bad financial institutions, you did these bad things, we're going to have to rein you in, was so onerous that it ended up capping the new entrance of small businesses, particularly small and community types of banks. It put a lot of other small banks out of business. And then, as you can imagine, as an after effect, um, both because of you know, having more costs and having to go up market and fewer smaller banks, lending to small businesses decreased multiple double digits. 
But what happened on the big side? Well, you have no competition now from the smaller guys. So the big guys end up getting bigger. There's more loans to big entities. In fact, I think uh, I've got a, a Fred chart in the book. I think it's like $17.7 trillion in uh, corporate non-financial debt right now taken down by companies. So we're supposed to be reining in the big banks and making sure that the little guys are taken care of and it's given the banks free reign. And we see this all the time with every piece of, of legislation or you know regulation that's proposed is, oh, well, we want to make sure it's a fair playing field. We want to make sure that we take look out for the little guy. And all it is, is just a, a cronious guys for less competition. And that has enabled more cronyism and moved us further away from capitalism, despite the beautiful, nice sounding label that they like to put on top of everything. That's right. Well, and uh, you actually, by the way, taught me that. I remember one of our first conversations and I used the term crony capitalism. And you said, Wayne, no, that's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, capitalism has nothing to do with cronyism. And but since we've had that conversation, by the way, I only use the term cronyism because it, it, it has nothing to do with capitalism. Uh, but and it, and it taints it. And that's part of the problem that we contend with is that you even right now with what's happened with the small businesses, you have people going, well, if you can't make it as a small business, you shouldn't be in business. It's like, well, right. the government shut that down. That's not free market competition. That's like the ultimate in central planning, making decisions. So when you start having this conflation of language, which I believe is intentional um, you know, to move us away from the free markets, you do start getting this conflation between cronyism and capitalism uh, and a whole bunch of other concepts as well, where I know you and I've talked about this before too. We, we've kind of lost the branding around what this free market capitalism and freedom and choice actually means. And it's just kind of conflated with, you know, quote unquote, private enterprise, um, which in our current situation, given the fact that the, the playing field has been so tilted by this cozy relationship between big business and government and special interests to some extent, um, it's like it's not capitalism at all. So uh, I, I appreciate you adopting the, uh, the, cro the cronyism moniker. <laughs> Well, and we got to keep pushing it, right? There's yeah. no such thing as crony capitalism. Either it's capitalism or it's cronyism, but it, right. it can't be both. Uh, and I think that, that's one thing I love about Dodd-Frank, your example there, because that is exactly kind of where we see the economy going. Regulations in the name of small businesses put on more burdens. So when you put on more burdens, a small business can't hire teams of lawyers to comply. And so Dodd-Frank is such a perfect example where there was some issues that went on and I think people misunderstood, but let's leave that for, for that, another That's day. a whole other webinar we can have about that, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But we're gonna put on new regulations because we wanna control the big banks and help the small banks. And you know, like Ronald Reagan said, the scariest words in the English language, right? I'm here, I'm the government, I'm here to help you. Right. What's happened is, the regulation, the expansion of government, right, gives uh, an advantage to large corporations. And that's the regulatory capture you said, right? That corporations in com combination with the government, they can work together. They understand one another. They're large bureaucracies. They have departments that can just talk to one another all day. If you're a small businessman or a small businesswoman, you don't have time to talk to the government all day. Or the cost. I mean, just think about the cost that's involved. Even something as simple as insurance requirements. You know, I'm based in, in Illinois, which is like, you know, headquarters for um, cronyism and government intervention and, and anything they can do to hurt small business. And, uh, you know, one of the things that like I want to put my head through a wall every single year is that I have to pay my employees who work from home on their computer extensive amounts of workers' compensation insurance. Like we're talking like thousands of dollars because they're sitting at home and they're gonna injure themselves typing. I mean, 70% of our economy right now is the service economy. We're not running huge machine factories and whatnot. Like, why, why am I doing this? And so the, like, not just the administration, but the cost. One that drives me crazy that I talk about in the book, and, and there's actually been some good uh, national pushback against that as well, is hair braiding. 
So you have the, these, these women and men who braid hair, the same thing that mom and dads do for their kids before they send them off to school, like all across the country. They're not using chemicals. They're not even picking up a scissor. And they have to spend thousands of dollars to go get trained, which, by the way, usually has nothing to do with hair braiding and continuing education requirements. And as you can imagine, this impacts particularly minority communities and less advantageous communities and women and you know, people who you really want to get into the situation where they're taking control of their economic freedom and creating these wealth opportunities. And from the get go, you're saying, well, sorry, you can't do it if you don't have these, you know, this, this cash grab, I mean, it's completely discriminatory against the small guy. That's right. And we see that over and over again, that, kind of, that theme of we're going to, for consumer protection, right. Right, we're going to have occupational licensing laws in places that you just hair braiding, you know, even hair cutting, right? I mean, if you're a stylist, do you really need the government training to teach you how to cut hair well? I mean, perhaps... You know, if I don't cut hair well, people won't patronize my store. And, you know, there's, right. yeah, like I'll post about it on Facebook and everybody will see my botched haircut one side up to here. And it's interesting because the pandemic really brought to light how many of these things were very silly because they had to remove a lot of these regulations to meet demands, you know, whether it was licensing, um, you know, for certain healthcare professionals to get more people who could, you know, go across state lines or whatnot to deal with COVID to the ultimate hand sanitizer debacle. The big, uh, big manufacturers ran out of hand sanitizer because we're all very clean now. So they removed regulations so more people could create hand sanitizer. And guess what happened? We had more <laughs> sanitizer. Like, oh, go figure. The market figured that out. Um, so it just it just goes to show that these are completely restrictive and obviously were completely insane. And the question is whether or not they're going to, you know, go back and say, well, okay, now that things are back to normal, you know, you can't do hand sanitizer, you can't deliver alcohol on Sunday, or, you know, whatever it is that they now took away, you know, to try to help during the pandemic, that was just an insane law and regulation to begin with. Well, and this is one of the big problems with big government, right? Where, where all of the increased spending, right? The temporary measures of spending, now President Biden wants to make those permanent. So the spending, temporary spending becomes permanent, but temporary deregulation <laughs> is temporary. Yeah, I mean, that's the scary part is, I mean, certainly things like the tax rate get changed around a lot, which frankly is really annoying as well, because how do you plan as an individual or business owner on you know, big things like, you know, whether you're exiting your business or investing in your business, if you don't know what the tax structure is, I mean, the fact that we have to even navigate around that is insane. Um, but there are so many things that they're talking about now that are difficult to repeal once you put into place, um, you know, things like raising the minimum wage, you know, on a national basis, which, you know, we, again, could probably spend a whole webinar on why that's insane. Um, but, you know, once that goes, you, you never get a point where, like, you raise the minimum wage and then you have an economic downturn and you lower it back down again. It only moves in one direction. You know, same things with benefits. You never cut those back. Um, so those are the kinds of things, you know, structurally that are super concerning because once they go into effect, it is so much more difficult to, to roll that back. And again, talking about the war on small business, the push to increase the minimum wage is a push that will harm small businesses and make small businesses less competitive to the larger businesses. So again, we have, this is just part of that ongoing government's growing, you know, we in the, this, the, the capital city know better. And you just, we talk about the importance of small business, but we keep passing laws that disadvantage them uh, in the marketplace. Yeah, and, and, and you're seeing now Amazon's jumping into the fight for 15 now. They want to see they want to see a $15 minimum wage. Of course they do because they know it's going to, you know, shutter a whole slew of, of additional small businesses and that business is going to come to them. So that's where you get this regulatory capture and the cronyism coming into play. The other thing that we had coming out of the pandemic and central planning is that a lot of these issues they tried to push on a de facto basis. I mean, the fact that they compensated people, not just your traditional unemployment, which your employer or depending on the state, 
right, you may also pay into and you certainly should have access to. But the fact that they did these enhanced unemployment bonuses and that, you know, they were $600 to begin with, they continue at $300. Obviously, some states have opted out, but that's a, a de facto way to push the minimum wage increase. And we're seeing the effects of it right now. We have 9.3 million jobs that are still unfilled and we're still down about 8 million workers in the workforce than where we stood in February, 2020 before all this disruption happened. So clearly you know, their specific actions are, you know, it's not a, a, a legislative way to do it but it's a very sneaky way to go in and to try to compete with the small business by offering, you know, this enhanced bonus to not work. And obviously, if some of the states have, have gotten wise to that, but you know, that's a really big issue, because either way, either way, the damage is done. And, you know, people are going to start having to, to offer more money. Um, and, and we've seen it. And in many cases for small businesses, they are offering more money, and they're offering signing bonuses, and they still can't get people back to work. That's right. And they're becoming less and less competitive. And beyond that, the, in, there are many entrepreneurs who at the start aren't even making minimum wage when you take into account all the hours they put into it. <laughs> and no one guarantees their wage, right? And they're taking right. all the risk. Right. And so, what, why, again, why would you do that? And that's, that's the, the kind of the sapping of the vitality, you know, coming up with the new ideas, how to serve people better. When you, you say... I can make $15 an hour, you know, without having to work hard, without having to kind of do, you know, all of the risk I have to take. And it's not just the 15 an hour too, right? When you raise the minimum wage, somebody that was making above the minimum wage, they're going to look for an increase as well. So what you're really doing, you know, if it really becomes pervasive is you're pushing up the entire wage scale. Right. And then you're pushing up the prices on the consumer to pay for it because it's happening to your vendors as well. And then right. you wonder why you're making $15 an hour, but now it costs $23 for a slice of pizza. <laughs> you have no more purchasing power. How did that possibly happen? I mean, it's a, it's a really challenging situation, obviously, for the small businesses. Now, something you, you mentioned earlier, and you spent a couple of chapters in the book uh, talking about the Federal Reserve. And this is complicated. I know people get very confused because it's very cryptic and monetary yeah. policy is one of those things where, you know, it's your eyes start to glaze over because you just, you, just, you, you don't, uh, it's so complicated. But I think it's so important because prior to the financial crisis, right, you had a Fed that only bought short-term government debt as a means to try to uh, conduct monetary policy. And they had a, about eight, $900 billion dollars worth of debt on their books and a few other assets. Now it went from, you know, let's say call it a trillion, went from a trillion to what you just cited earlier, $8 trillion. So the Federal Reserve has increased its footprint. And this is a way for the government to control the economy, right? Has increased its footprint eight times. And it's not just buying short-term government debt. Now it owns mortgage-backed securities. So it's influencing the mortgage markets. It's owning corporate debt and it's owning long-term government debt. And on top of it, it's allowing the government to issue debt, right? People keep trying to say, well, is the, uh, the, the market isn't expecting inflation, but of course not because the Federal Reserve <laughs> is the one, they're the largest buyer now. So they are the government debt market. So we are monetizing all of this spending and there's all sorts of macroeconomic implications, but do you talk about how it hurts small businesses the worst? or the most, I should say. And so I'd love to talk about that in terms of why, why are small businesses most disadvantaged from this just transformation of the Federal Reserve? Yeah, I mean, it's small businesses and it's also the little guy, the, the saver and the retiree. Um, I think that the biggest thing, if you think about, you know, when you get interest on your money it, it, or you go out and you make an investment and you require a rate of return, that's compensation for risk taking. And it used to be that we would have some understanding of, OK, well, I'm taking on you know, a certain amount of risk. And if it's more risky, I'm going to make more money. And if it's you know, not very risky, I'm still going to make something because I'm you know, still taking a little bit of risk on. And by intervening in the market in the way that they have, you know, buying all these securities and, and suppressing the interest rate, they've disrupted 
the notion of risk in the market. So now you've got more people who are seeking out more risk. You have bigger companies who are able to take down more capital at you know almost no cost. So think about it. like you go to the bank as a saver or retiree, you have your money in there, you're hoping to get something back to live on and they're not giving you anything, but they're loaning out to these companies at very little interest cost and they're able to go out and expand. And what it does net net is it props up companies who shouldn't be there. Uh, one of the parts I talk about are zombie companies, which are these companies that don't make enough profit to be able to service the interest on their debt, let alone the principal. But because of this disruption in the, the market, they're hanging out and they're sucking up capital that otherwise would be used for more innovative endeavors. Uh, by the way, they also have about two, two, two million jobs attached to them. So that's a potential crisis there. Although obviously we, we have a lot of people who, uh, who need to hire workers. So maybe not as much as one would have thought uh, otherwise. Um, and it just creates a, an advantage in terms of the amount of capital that these big guys are able to deploy versus the little guys and little people having to take on more risk in order to get any yield. And that's where you're seeing it kind of loop back around um, into the housing market. There's been a big outroar and outrage lately because BlackRock is going in and buying up single family homes and taking those opportunities away or competing with the average home buyer. And in some cases, not adding a lot of value in the process. It's not like you're funding the guy who's, who's building the house. They're just kind of a, a middleman and collecting a toll. And that's basically being done with taxpayer money. So if you think about it, this is part of this huge wealth transfer that's happening both on the fiscal level with you know, the small business being closed and the money going to the big businesses, but on a monetary policy level where they're inflating the assets, they're inflating the value, they're getting more capital to the big guys and giving them this other advantage in the market. And it's just, it's just unprecedented. We, we've never seen anything like this. And so in terms of how does it all end, um, there are a whole host of scenarios, many of which are not really pleasant, but it's just so hard to say based on what's happening here in the US and around the world. But that's why you have this huge crypto push. That's why you have so many people who are like looking to Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or these other um, assets because they feel like they can't trust the government and, you know, the Fed, which is quasi government, you know, wink, wink, you know, we're, we're independent, um, you know, to less and less so every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the, to, you know, to, to not devalue our dollar and to not do these, these crazy things. And then, as you said, the, the whole enabling the, the bad government behavior to continue to spend because they're standing by ready to purchase that debt. So it's a, it's a horrible cycle because it is so intentionally opaque and complicated to understand by design, uh, people aren't spending enough of time saying like, we need we need to rein this in, like this is a bad thing for the economy and this is the biggest facilitator of the wealth transfer and we need to stop that. I, I think that wealth transfer is so important that the idea that since bank interest rates are so low, right, savers are in effect funding the low costs uh, that are kind of going to, to uh, yeah. the, the large corporations. And you also have, retirees who are looking for interest, extending their risk. Risk and return is always intimately linked. If you need a certain amount of income to live, you need to go out on a risk profile that 10, 15, 20 years ago, no financial advisor would say you should be taking on that type of risk. But if, if you don't now, you're just not getting enough income to live. So there's all of these capital market distortions that uh, we don't know how it's going to end, but there's certainly some very scary possibilities. I love the way you, you put that, that, the scary possibilities that are out there. If this does not end the way the central planners mathematical models say that it should end. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure they have mathematical models at this point or that they're even following their mandate because their mandate is supposed to be stable prices, which we know they are not. <laughs> they've not stabilized the prices and supposed to be full employment. And I would argue if you have 
you know, three million jobs available and nobody's going back, that you probably have uh, employment that's not going to be moved by monetary policy. Let's just let's just call it like it is. So what are they really doing? They're they're transferring wealth. They're propping up the stock market. They're you know enabling government spending, and that's not their mandate. That's not what they're set up to do. And it's it's actually one of the chapters, uh, particularly the one chapter about the Fed, and I talk about in other places um, that I've gotten. You know, one of the two chapters I've gotten the most positive feedback because so many people, like you said, don't really understand it. I've spent a lot of time trying to break it down in a way that you can understand it, and more important, the implications of, of what's going to you know, co- potentially come out in all of the ways that uh, they're facilitating wealth transfer and, and reckless behavior in, in the financial system. Well, we're, we're beginning to, to, to run out of time. I would love to be able to have questions, but before we kind of open up to, to questions, I'd love to talk about you know, we, we, we kind of couch this whole thing in that we have a growth of cronyism, which is crowding out capitalism, which is kind of leading to all these uh, kind of adverse outcomes. And so you, you weren't just negative in the book, right? you didn't just bring up these problems. You also talk about, you know, well, where do we go from here? How do we arrest the growth of cronyism and allow capitalism to flourish? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, from an individual standpoint, like the very easiest thing that you can do is actually support small business. Uh, my ongoing joke is, Alexa, why does Jeff Bezos have so much money? You know, if you're, you're, you're spending all your money with Amazon, like obviously they're going to do better and they're going to have more power and then the cloud on top of it. Um, so be thoughtful about, you know, where it is that you're spending your dollars and how you want to support small business because you can't not support them and then wonder like why it is that they don't exist anymore. So we have a responsibility, you know, in capitalism to allocate dollars. Uh, I think we need to push back very heavily on regulation, um, any certainly anything new that comes up, whether it's the PRO Act, whether it's the $15 minimum wage, you know, whatever it is, and really think through those unintended consequences. Um, even now they're talking about this, you know, let's, let's break up Facebook. Like, I'm not sure if you separate it you know, into Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and what Oculus, like they're going to have any less power or control over you. But what do those regulations look like? And you know, who does it keep out of the market to actually compete with them? I think those are the things that we need to think through. Um, and like, we, we got to figure out a way to br- break up this duopoly here. I mean, the biggest duopoly that we have in this country is between our two party system. And the fact of the matter is, and, and you know, this book is meant as a nonpartisan book, it's political, but it's not about political parties. It's about a system that's broken. And so we need to figure out a way to, to get rid of that stranglehold because the government has gotten out of control under the purview of both parties. So, so we just need less to be done in that arena and more to be done elsewhere. And I know, you know, if you're somebody who likes freedom and liberty and is your small business, you just want to be left alone. But unfortunately, freedom is something we have to actively preserve. And we have done a really poor job in a lot of areas. We've done a good job in areas like the Second Amendment. Um, but in other areas, we've done a poor job. So I feel like we need to push back there. And then I also feel like we need to use the legal system more. Um, a lot of people who donate spend a lot of time trying to put you know, somebody into Congress who's going to create more laws and do those things. Like we need to challenge the things that are on the books already. I talk about in the book how many laws you know, over, I think it was a 50 year period they looked at that didn't include the last 20 years, over a million new laws at the state level. And then at the national level, it was like 12 or 15,000 laws and like 20,000 regulations over a, you know, a smaller period. Like hundreds of those at most are challenged in court. And a lot of them are not constitutional or infringements on our rights. So I think we need to spend more time challenging those because if we challenge those laws and say no you can't do that you can't do these things that are infringing on our rights then i think the politicians eventually will be less likely to try to put those things in place so you know those are some of the things that uh and more (laughs) well with that i'd love to just emphasize again that your new book which is really fantastic it's called the war on small business it's available today for purchase online there it is uh, it's uh, online or in stores, even in small bookstores, a great place to uh, uh, kind of support small businesses and 
Yeah, if, I, if I can throw an idea out there too. So, I mean, obviously I'm capitalist, so buy it wherever you want, but if you do want to take what we just said to heart, um, there's a store called bookshop.org online and their entire raison d'etre is to support local businesses. So if you buy it through them, they'll actually fulfill it from a local small business retailer. So bookshop.org, it's just as easy as any other site. And uh, they actually support the small business on the back end. That's fantastic. You know, I guess... I would love to just get more into the idea of cronyism uh, and talk about the, the dangers of cronyism kind of uh, writ large more, right? They've, if we're saying that, because we're talking about branding of capitalism. And to me, one of the things that we haven't really discussed this yet is that, right, the answer to cronyism is less government. The right. answer to cronyism is we need government to play its role because it has an important role, but you right. got to stay within those bounds. Right. The, if capitalism is a, is a problem, then the answer is big government. And so that gets to that kind of the branding. And to me, I think it's very important. Uh, and I would love to kind of have your take on this. If we want to kind of properly brand capitalism, then we need to uh, do a couple of things. One of the things is the idea that capitalism doesn't mean we're not going to actively pursue a problem, right? Something that big government proponents always have is we have a problem and here's a solution. We will do X. In capitalism, the idea is not that we won't do something, it's that we're going to empower millions of people to right. do something. And when you empower more people, more ideas, all of us make mistakes, and we need to learn from mistakes. But capitalism allows us to learn from mistakes. Cronyism, you never learn from your mistakes. Big government, you don't learn from your mistakes. You double down because that's the only, only way to operate, and that, that bureaucracy. And I think that idea of, of branding capitalism as it's not just letting some obscure market kind of take care of things. It's capitalism empowers people, millions and tens of millions of people to address a problem because no one person has enough knowledge, enough understanding is brilliant enough to have all of the answers to all of our problems. And I think when we're talking about branding or differentiating capitalism from cronyism, that that becomes an essential component to it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think that the word capital and capitalism or the concept, you know, the, the Marx has kind of bastardized it by making it sound like you're capitalizing on something, which makes it sound bad instead of good, is, you know, to talk more about freedom and choice and, and you know, power to the people and, you know, your, your freedom, your choice, your work, your choice, whatever it is, transparency, all the, the main tenets of it. Um, and, you know, how you can bring that even to certain government uh, institutions and entities and, and ideas and problems. You know, one of the things I didn't talk about in the book because we wanted to try and, and stay focused, but um, I, I had in a previous draft was talking about something like social security and how you could bring um, free market tenants to social security. Because, you know, obviously people who are like strict free marketeers that don't want any safety net. But if you agree, OK, well, we should have a safety net, but let's empower people. So instead of me paying my money to the government, having them spend it, sticking in an IOU, which, by the way, is just like other people in the future <laughs> having to pay for it because they don't mm -hmm. produce anything in the government. You know, what if when we paid in and our employers paid in on our behalf, like we own that money, we had a provident fund. So even if it was mandated by government, they weren't in control of the money, we were in control. And instead of you know, investing it in a government IOU, we could actually invest it in the markets and in wealth creation opportunities, assuming it wasn't distorted by the Fed at that point in time. And then maybe you take a portion of the employer piece and you use that to fund people who aren't working. So again, we have that little bit of social safety net, but they still own it and they still have that wealth creation opportunity and they can pass it on to an heir. And then you've just taken a huge chunk of government power and control out of the equation because there's no reason why they should be managing that money. If you're just trying to accomplish a social safety net, they can still mandate it but we can still have that ownership and empowerment. So to me, that's a great example of a place where you could bring free market principles to something that you know, we feel like is important from a, a, a social standpoint and have that, that objective met in a better way. And balance kind of the, the, yeah. the two. One, one question that's arose, and I don't know if you have a, a good answer. If someone wants to get this type of information kind of you know, and learn more about it, is there a data sources? particularly in California, which is where we're located, uh, where someone can learn more about these types of 
of issues? So which, which issues? Because obviously, you know, the, the economic issues, you know, Fred, you know, you can go, go into the database and, and do those. Uh, the COVID issues, there are databases for those. Which, which set of issues? Uh, small business closure, small business, the health of the small business economy, because th- yeah. that thing is hard to get at. Yeah, there's actually, there's a project that's sponsored um, by Harvard uh, in conjunction with the Hamilton Project that's called Open Something. I don't remember it. If you put, if you type into your search engine, um, you know, small business closures, you'll get to this project pretty quickly by Harvard that shows it. The only thing I will tell you about the data, and this is, um, you know, as a small business expert, one of the things that kind of drives me crazy is people don't really understand what constitutes small business. So I'm somewhat skeptical that their numbers are high. Like they're showing nationally that we have somewhere between 35 and 40% of all small businesses closed. Now, I told you at the top of the hour that, uh, you know, we have before COVID 30.2 million small businesses. I don't think 10 million of them to 12 million of them have closed. I think that's either um, employer owned businesses, which would make it around 2 million, which feels a little bit more accurate, or maybe it's consumer facing businesses. I'm still trying to get in contact with them to like go like, where are these numbers coming from? Um, but it's definitely not a, an, a, a somebody with an agenda that's trying to push that big number. I think it's just a fundamental misunderstanding. So anytime you look at those numbers, you know, look at it with a, a grain of salt. Uh, but there are organizations like this that are tracking. And just remember, because we have, you know, employer businesses, we have solopreneurs, we have gig work, a lot of times those get conflated. But you can reach out to me, you know, I'm on Twitter at Carol J.S. Roth, I spend a lot of time on there. If you ever have questions, I'm happy, because um, I'm doing research on this all the time to try to point you in the right direction or let you know if I have pulled out, you know, new data or new sources. Have you ever used the Yelp um, data on closures? I've just discovered that. Recently. I did. I, I used it actually in the book in a couple of places. And that's interesting, but it, that's specific to the Yelp platform. So it's a proxy for, you know, that's a subset, obviously, of all the small businesses. Not every small business is on Yelp. So it's a, an interesting proxy to show of their group, you know, what that looks like. Um, the same thing, Alignable um, is another great group. They've got about, you know, five to six million small business owners on their platform. And um, they do multiple polls and surveys. So they usually get around 3,500 or 4,000 respondents. Um, but again, it's, it's biased to what kinds of small businesses those are and whatnot. But the findings are horrific, like 35% of small businesses from the June rent poll don't think they can pay their June rent. Well, and and again, so across the sources, the fact that they're all so consistent in yeah. terms of whatever the number might be, they're all grim, right? And yeah, all yeah I, mean, I don't care if it's like, I mean, the, the, the Biden White House has come out and said more than 400,000 small businesses are closed. I know that's low, but even if it were only that, like 400,000, like, oh my God, that's like 40 times the number of big businesses that exist in this country. Like that's staggering. We've never had anything like that in history. Right. Well, we've actually used up our whole hour. So I, this one last time, we'd love to uh, to push the book. Carol, you did a fantastic job. It's a wonderful book, The War on Small Business, uh, purchased online, small bookstores today. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.